since 2009, George Troop has been walking, really walking, from Washington State down through Oregon and California, through Arizona, New Mexico, across Texas, into the Deep South. Now, with Washington, D.C. in his sights, he makes a pit, a pit stop here in Charlotte, and we take this opportunity to find out why this man has been walking for three years. George Troop, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. You call this your pilgrimage of inspiration. Why? Well, basically, what I'm looking to do is inspire people to take steps into living healthier lifestyles and thereby reducing the risk of cancer. Now, what I mean by that is that of 1.6 million cancers that Americans get every year. That's actually nearly 5,000 cancers that Americans are going to be diagnosed with just today that experts warn us that at least two-thirds of these cancers can be prevented. And so, you know, we hear that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. I definitely applaud those who are looking for the cure. Yet, if we can prevent it in the first place, then it's worth it. Yeah, you point out that a lot of the efforts that we're most familiar with deal with cure, help, helping to find a cure or helping to promote the finding of a cure. And your effort is one of the few that I've ever heard of. I don't think I've ever heard of another one that's talking about prevention. Correct. Um, I haven't heard of another one either. Well, actually, once I started doing some research, I did hear of others. But um, otherwise, I just I, I had heard a lot about the cure, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Yet, if again, if an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, then we need to focus more on prevention, and we need to focus more on living healthier lifestyles, which is that's the way to prevent cancer. Um, of course, we hear about tobacco cessation overall, and how tobacco has a link to cancer. Right. However, exercise and diet, um, stress management, those being the big three. We don't hear about those quite as much. And that's what I'm walking to emphasize is just an overall. Of course, exercise and diet is not the end-all be-all to to prevent cancer. It's certainly one of the things that goes into preventing cancer, but not all cancers will be prevented by that. So do you worry that focusing on that aspect of this may lead people to some some sort of false sense of security? Well, not at all. And I actually, basically what I tell people is I advocate sort of a seatbelt approach to life. I mean, you, you buckle up in the car, it reduces your risk of dying in an auto accident. That being said, or you put a helmet on a motorcyclist and um, he's not as likely to die in an accident. However, there is still a risk. And so buckling your seatbelt, I mean, there is potentially a risk where you could die in an auto accident. However, your chances of that go way down. And so that's what I advocate with a healthy lifestyle is basically a seatbelt approach toward healthy living, toward everyday life. Mm -hmm. This all started, as I understand it, uh, with your mother's death from cancer. She was 33. You were then nine. Uh, and I believe you started your walk at the age of 33. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. She died at age 33, two days before her 34th birthday. I began this walk at age 33, two days before my 34th birthday, and from the very same home, childhood home, where she last lived. We have to take a break. We're going to come back and find out more about George Troop's Walk Across America. You can find out more yourself at enjoythewalk.com, but we're going to take a break and come back and find out exactly what this experience has been like. 4,000 miles on foot. Stay with us. Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and the Comedy Zone, located at the North Carolina Music Factory, presenting comedy legend Bob Saget Friday and Saturday. Tickets available at cltcomedyzone.com. And Winston-Salem State University, transforming their campus along with the education that takes place there. Details at wssu.edu. The role of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and what's needed to regulate Wall Street, the topic of the Diane Ream Show at 10 o'clock. This morning. By the way, Mel Chin, our guest in the first portion of our program, is speaking at UNC Charlotte's McKnight Hall tomorrow at 12.30. You can get details about that lecture for a few dollars more. That's the name of the lecture, not the price of it, at our website, wfae.org slash Charlotte Talks. And if you want to talk about walking, now's your chance. 704-926-WFAE. That's 704-926-9323, 800-603-WFAE and wfae.org slash Charlotte Talks. 
2012 was a very busy news year, and WFAE kept you informed on the important issues and stories that impacted your life. We're committed to doing the same in 2013 with your help. As this year draws to a close, please make a tax-deductible investment in public radio today and be entered to win a trip for two to the Azores. No pledge is necessary, but we hope you'll support WFAE this year. Call 704-549-9000 or make your gift online at WFAE.org. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. George Troop is our guest in this segment. He's walking across America. He began his trip in 2009, is that right? Yes. Uh, in Vancouver, Washington State, uh, and is on his way to Washington, D.C. He's been on the road, on his feet, since that time. You started this when you were 33 years old, two days before your 34th birthday. Most people in that age bracket probably would have a hard time starting that because they'd have to leave a job. You did leave a job. They'd have to leave their their career aspirations. They'd have to put their family life on hold. How were you able to do it? You know, I just kind of felt a calling from within that I um, needed to get up, go out, and do something better for the world around me. And um, while many people in their 30s, they're very ambitiously pursuing a career, um, I'm actually ambitiously pursuing a calling in life. Mm -hmm. And so basically this is how I'm able to do it. I mean, I don't have any of – I call them the three M's, marriage, mortgage, and munchkins, uh, basically (laughs) at this point in life. And so, of course, that allows me an uh, an additional degree of flexibility to do something like this. Mm -hmm. Um, If I had any one of those, which, you know, who knows, maybe in five years I have all three M's, but at this point I don't, and therefore I have the ability to do this. I have a window of opportunity, and I'm seizing that opportunity. Uh, A lot of people say that they are too busy to exercise. You've given up so far three years of your life of doing pretty much nothing else but exercising because walking is exercise. Mm -hmm. Is that to help people understand that, you know, 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes three times a week is not a lot? Well, yeah, I hope it has that impact, you know. Um, And actually walking, as far as I'm concerned, um, anybody can carve out 20 minutes of their day. And now I understand that there are some people that have such just um, atrociously busy days that uh, perhaps on, you know, this day or that day or whatever, it, it they may not be able to, to, to eke out 20 minutes. Uh, but I'm, I'm basically, I'm advocating for a 20-minute average and for that to be a first step toward leading a healthier lifestyle. And even if people just want to start leading a healthier lifestyle by, by um, replacing sugary beverages with water, mm-hmm. you know, um, anything for a first step. I just, I advocate walking because it goes w- so well with the fact that I'm walking across America for one. Mm-hmm. And also walking, you know, you don't need any special classes or equipment or exercise um, videos or anything like that. You just get up, go out and take a walk. Yeah. Uh, uh, you uh, are doing this at, uh, also, I'm going back to your age, at a time in life when people are trying to build for the future, they're trying to build their retirement nest egg. Uh, and you've you walked away from a job. At some point, I guess you'll walk back toward a job. Um, how do you think this three-year blank in your work-life resume will appear to somebody? you think this will actually be a plus because you devoted real effort to this over time? You know, I'm convinced it's going to be a plus. I mean, as far as a blank is concerned, I am more than confident to go into any employer XYZ in the future and say, this is what I've been doing with my life in Mm -hmm. recent years. Because the people that I've been meeting along the way, it's not every day that they they meet someone who's decided to go, go ahead and leave the job and leave the money and get up and go out and do something different with life and make a radical change. And so a lot of people, they kind of open their eyes at that and say, um, you know, this is, this is, um, they tell me their dream, you know, sometimes what they dream of doing in the future or, you know, depending on their age, what they wish they would have done in years right. past. And, um, I actually, I don't want to work for an employer that's going to criticize me for having answered this calling in my 30s. And so as far as I'm concerned, that'll make me selective. Yeah. If someone says, oh, you've just wasted time for the last five years, it's like, okay, well, thank you very much. I guess I don't need this job after all. <laughs> yeah. how, how, are you, how are you eating? How are you, how are you buying shoes? Because you've got to buy more than one pair of shoes to do this. Yes. Uh, how, how is this being funded? You know, um, that's an excellent question. And uh, the answer to that basically is that, okay, so I actually – you know, as long as food and shelter are provided to me, uh, or as long as I find food and shelter, my expenses aren't much greater than I actually, surprisingly, any time in the past when I had traveled, it was um, at least twice as expensive to travel as it was to live at home. Vacations were very expensive. 
Now, though, this isn't really a vacation. Well, in fact, it's not at all. And um, living on the road, actually, is much more affordable than living at home. So I saved up a bunch of money before um, in starting on this endeavor, and I've actually gone into debt, and so I'm going to be about 10000 in debt when I finish this. But otherwise, shelter, I've paid for two separate motel room stays. I've paid for maybe a, hand, a handful of campground stays. In three um, years. Yes, in three years. And I actually over, and I, I couldn't have predicted this before setting out on the walk, but over 90% of the time, people host me. And that, it, that's been true across the United States. And just to give you uh, the most recent example, so Mike and Mary Zucker, they're a couple who are hosting me here in the Charlotte area, mm-hmm. very nice people. They're actually friends with um, a very nice couple, Bob and Chris, who hosted me in Greer, South Carolina. And so quite often people, they hear the story or they have a friend that hosted me or just you know any one of a number of means, and I'm hosted that way. And so the last time I slept outdoors was actually in Alabama. What, what happened in Alabama? <laughs> well, um, goodness, there, there were – through the state of Alabama, I think there were maybe three occasions that I slept outdoors. And um, it's just that a lot of time, usually big cities are the easiest – I mean, there are people that know that I'm coming and right. that you know have invited me in. But there might be little small towns along the way that – um, Exactly. And so my first night in Alabama was Grand Bay, Alabama, having come in from Pascagoula, Mississippi. And um, – it's just a tiny town, you know. Nobody was expecting me, and so I actually came into town, and um, there were a bunch of cars parked at the Methodist Church, and various churches have helped me, you know, with hosting along the way. And so I decided to knock on the door, and the pastor was there; he was present. They were having a meeting, and I told them what I was doing. Typically, I, I show a recent newspaper article, so right. you know, there's your credibility. Right. And um, they found a place outside the church where I could sleep, and, and I ended up sleeping on like the little kids' clubhouse at the playground outside. And so, um, yeah, yeah, you know. And so it's like many days I walk into. It's nice to know where I'm going to end the day, and, and you know, with whom I may be ending the day. But there are many times that I just walk into the day, and I'm not sure where it's going to end. So you started this walk on September twentieth, two thousand nine, in Vancouver, Washington. You've taken uh-huh. the southern route across the country, down through Oregon and California, and across the deep uh, south desert, the desert south. Southwest through Texas, yes. the deep south, and now mm-hmm. up toward Washington, D.C. Uh, how much planning did you did? How, how did you plan this? How, when you set out on foot, did you know exactly where you were going, or, or what route you would take? I knew that I was going to take a southern route, and actually, interestingly enough. I had initially planned on a nine-month walking timeline. So I figured, okay, 20 miles a day, six days a week with at least one day off, and I will make it across America in nine months. That was my initial plan. And actually the best decision that I've made since beginning the walk, since taking my first footsteps, has been to scrap that deadline. Mm. Um, it just it, Walking across the Golden Gate Bridge two months into the walk, I found that I had been causing myself way too much stress both physically and emotionally, to try to um, keep in line with this deadline for one. And for two, having just walked through the, you know, the beautiful, magical California redwoods, mm-hmm. um, I had been receiving so many invitations to spend extra time and to meet people and places and just basically um, have an experience of walking across America. Yet I was just so militant about, got to get my 20 miles, got to get my 20 miles. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, just by far the best decision I could have made was to scrap the deadline. So originally, I was going to spend the fall going south and then the winter going across the south, so basically south from Washington State during the fall and then crossing the southern United States during the winter and then coming back up toward Washington, D.C. during the spring. Mm -hmm. So um, this nine-month timeline has mushroomed into three years. And I actually, I I haven't um, adjusted the route, though, as far as, you know, south and then across and then back up. What time of year did you actually cross through Arizona and New Mexico, which is the desert? Um, Basically, okay, so February February 2010, I started um, my eastbound trek from Santa Monica, California. And so I made it to El Paso, goodness, uh, just as summer 2010 was starting. And so I've had plenty of hot days. And actually during the summers, uh, during summers of both 2010 and 2011, I took several months off. Um, 2012, uh, I did walk through the summer, and it was, uh, but still at a much slower pace. And it was Alabama and Georgia um, and part of Florida. And it was just atrociously hot. And, you know, but Hotter than Arizona and New Mexico? Well, um, the the good thing about Arizona and New Mexico, dry heat. 
Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, no, it's still it's it's blistering hot. But the difference is, is that once I get underneath um, a tree or some form of shade, uh, you know, it could be thirty degrees cooler yeah. in that shade. Not in Alabama. Not in Alabama. Yeah. Not in Georgia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you did you walk at night a lot in the in the in the hotter months, or did you walk in the daytime in the blazing sun? There was a combination. I mean, I would try to spend um, the hot part of the afternoon um, in some shaded area, but it, it, it would just depend. I mean, uh, there have been days that I've walked, goodness, the longest day I walked was 35 miles, and there have been days where I've walked five miles or less. And so um, if it's just, if it's a relatively short day, then I can do that, you know, in the evening hours. You've been morning. walking for three years. I don't know how sedentary or how much you exercised prior to embarking on this trip you did, but how has your body changed over, over these last three years? You know, Mike, I'm 37 years old, and I actually feel a lot healthier today mm-hmm. than I did 10 years ago at age 27. And the reason for that, um, I was leading, by and large, a sedentary lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And now I'm much more active, and I, I eat much better quality food. And um, I, my body just feels much stronger at age 37 than it did at age 27 you're, or 25. You're a vegetarian too, aren't you? I am, yes. How difficult mm-hmm. has that been to, to keep that diet going as you go to different and strange places across the country? You know, um, yeah, that's an interesting question because I, I, you know, I walked over a thousand miles through Texas and as a vegetarian. <laughs> and so uh, that's easy to do in the big cities because in the big cities, there are always small vegetarian enclaves. But in small town America, and I would say even most recently in um, Clover, South Carolina, I, I was invited in by a nice family and um, they took me to one of their local diner restaurants. And the waitress, when, you know, I explained to her that I was a vegetarian and that, Therefore, I ate no meat. She kind of stared at me for a second, and then she started laughing, you know, quietly to herself. Um, and so I basically, I, I have to be creative, and I have to ask them good questions of, okay, so um, do you have any rice and beans? And, you know, just kind of figure out what they have that they usually put together with meat and sort of um, create a meal with them, a meal plan with them. And it's always possible. Is, is your being a vegetarian part and parcel of this uh, fitness uh, regimen that would be aimed at preventing cancer, or is this something else altogether different? It's, um, it, you know, you, you're right on the money there, Mike. It, it's, um, it is part of my healthier lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And so, and it's actually just... How long have you been vegetarian? Uh, about 12 years now. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, that being said, I'm not a militant vegetarian. Right. I mean, sometimes there's a myth out there that, um, you know, vegetarians scream at the sight of meat. And no, <laughs> that's, that's not the case. I mean, uh, you know, I was raised on, you know, meat for every meal for the most part for... Um, the majority of my life, sure. and so I, you know, I'm at the table with meat all the time, and that's the the true for you know 99 percent of vegetarians. There may be some militant ones, but um, yeah, I just it, it, I like vegetarianism as a healthier lifestyle choice overall. Do you walk in all weathers? If it's a particularly cold day, or a particularly wet day, or a particularly hot, dry day, do you do you take a day off? Do you, do you shorten your route to t- walk less, or, or or do you just go because you're the, but you have to make your 20 miles or your 20 kilometers or whatever you've projected for that day? You know, okay, so I walk 100 percent of the miles, but there are times where yeah, maybe I was going to walk a 24 mile day. And because of weather factors or other factors, that there's a town in the middle and I'm deciding to stop there for the mm-hmm, night. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has happened. Uh, that being said, though, during the rain, I mean, I'm from a very rainy part of the country, the Pacific Northwest. And so it's not like rain scares me or bothers me. That being said, though, I've learned over the course of the miles that a lot of cars, they, they're not as good a driver as a lot of times um, during wet conditions. And so in many of the places where I walk – people are not expecting to find pedestrians. I mean, of course, here in Charlotte or in a big city, I have sidewalks to walk on. Mm-hmm. And there are places where you expect to see pedestrians on walking paths or jogging trails. Those I can easily walk in the rain. It doesn't matter. But when I'm in the middle of two small towns and there's just some lonely 70-mile-an-hour highway yeah. um, and people that drive that you know, highway for decades, are nev- they never see pedestrians. And suddenly I'm, in, you know, I'm there uh, around a curve on a day of low visibility and there's not much of a shoulder. I mean, it's dangerous to me. It's dangerous to them. Uh, they don't have as much reaction time when it's wet, for one right, thing. And, right. and not only that, I mean, I wear glasses. Sadly, um, a good three or four hours of you know hardcore walking, and I'm my glasses fog up. Right. And so, um, so rainy weather, I try to um, limit my miles in rainy rainy weather. I don't I don't want to do you know twenty mile days in the rainy weather just because of the danger factor. How many pairs of shoes have you been through? 
Um, I, I've been through 10. Well, I'm on pair number 10 right now. I actually switched to sandals when I reached Abilene, Texas. And in, goodness, in, in days that have been below freezing and days that have been over 100 and, and including rainy days, um, I've worn the sandals all the way through and I love them. What have you learned about yourself, about America, about people as you've done this? You know, um, so about myself, I've learned about myself what is, well, what's true for everyone in society is true for myself as well, that every single one of us has enormous potential in life to create a better world for ourselves and for everyone around us. Now, as far as what I've learned about America is that um, despite what we may see on any local given newscast uh, about, you know, the five violent crime stories of the day, right. that by and large, um, people are, you know, 99.9% of the time, they're good people. Uh, I've walked over 4,000 miles now. I've never once been robbed. I've never been attacked. I've never been threatened. And I imagine that I'll make it the rest of the way into Washington, D.C., and the very same is going to be true. I hope and, you're right. Uh, where will you end this walk? I'm going to be ending this walk at the White House. Do they know you're coming? <laughs> You know, um, there are a couple of people that I know that have contacts with the White House, and I haven't worked on utilizing those contacts just yet because I don't want to give an exact deadline or or arrival date because, I mean, I'm kind of taking this walk one step at a time, excuse the pun. But uh, and, and what will happen when this is over, when you've gotten to the White House and it's, it's, you've put a period on the end of the sentence here, where, what happens to you? What do you do now? You know, I have a number of options available to me. That being said, though, um, the same, I'll call it divine intuition, that led me to take this walk in the first place is keeping me wide open to opportunities that may present themselves and unfold as the walk concludes. Hmm. Uh, George Troop is walking across America, and you can find out more about his walk because technology, he blogs on a regular basis. Technology allows you to do that while you're on the road. Enjoythewalk.com is the name of that of that website, and you can contribute, I guess, to it there as well. Uh, you're kind of like a modern-day uh, Jack Kerouac in a way. Well, yeah, and, and there's no donation link. It's just a, it's a, it's a walk of inspiration. Thanks for being here, and good luck on the rest of your walk. Thank you, Mike.